Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly Q&A session. Uh, all tech related, of course. If you've got any questions about your bike, fixing your bike, maintaining your bike, suspension designs, any of that sort of stuff, um, hit us up in the comments underneath there. Uh, please use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech so you know which ones are questions and we will put them on the show. Uh, okay, so first up is, oh, straight into a massive question here from Peter Hanneman. Um, Doddy, with all the various suspension designs on the market, it's getting harder and harder to differentiate them, and I've been riding for 10 plus years. The excessive marketing BS and differing shock setups don't help either. What I'd really like to see is a comprehensive analysis of each of the prevailing designs independent of the shock. Personally, I'm interested in the XC stroke trail crossover category, uh, but I'm sure other viewers would appreciate a more expansive lineup. Um, try and make sense of the pros and cons of each, making my head spin. Uh, loving the show, keep up the good work. Wow, okay. Um, all right, so this probably shouldn't be a question for us. This, there's a lot to this. Um, I will make a really detailed video on this. I just need to figure out the way to make it simple so it's really easy for everyone to understand. Um, bear with me on that. I'm gonna have to go and buy some Meccano, I reckon, to make that happen, and I'll build some suspension designs basically to show you how they work. Uh, but let's have a little look at the most common designs out there. So first up on the screen, this is a single pivot, and the bike on the screen is an orange. So it's a very classic design, and what you can see is there's a single main pivot on the frame and where the wheel axle is at the back and you've got the shock. Nice and simple. So it's a very simple design. Um, obviously it's got one main pivot. The pros of that are it's very easy to service, very easy to change those bearings and it can be a very light design. Uh, the only limitation really is the leverage curve um, is very simple, there's not much you can do with it, um, and it's quite a linear design, so it does rely on the shock, um, basically having to give it sort of a progressive feel, perhaps by putting volume spaces in, stuff like that. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing though, because you're gonna use all that travel, and single pivot bikes are very simple, can be very light as well. Right, next up is a single pivot, uh, and it's got a linkage driven shock. So the one on the screen is a Kona, um, there's lots of different models, but they all use the same sort of suspension platform. I think this one's a Process 134. Uh, we put this one on the tech show a few weeks back. It's one of their latest bikes. Now, it still has the same main pivot and still has the axle at the back, so it's still nothing's changed in there. It still works the same way as a classic single pivot like the Orange. The difference here is it's got a linkage to manipulate how the shock action feels and how that rear suspension action feels. So there's a lot that can be done with a linkage activated single pivot. Okay, next one is the four bar. So the example on the screen here is a classic specialized stumpy. Uh, this is the Evo model, I think. So the classic design here is the difference between the faux bar, which we saw with the Kona. Look where the pivot point is on the chain stay as opposed to on the seat stay. Now this really does change things dramatically. So the first thing it changes is the fact that um, braking has little or no effect on the rear suspension um, in use. So that is the major selling point of that. Now that pivot used to be known as the Horst link after Horst Leitner, who designed that pivot point on one of the early AMP research bikes. And he actually designed that link for Specialized to use on their bikes and Specialized later licensed it and they called it the FSR link. Um, although in the industry, everyone still knows it as the Horst link. Uh, this is the most common design ever used. It's still used today by Specialized, it's used by Cube, it's used by loads of different brands. Uh, and when the orientation, of all those pivot points are done exactly right, it can be the best suspension platform out there. It's really good, really simple, really effective. Um, okay, so next up is a short link four bar design. Now there's loads of different options on the market. There's the Santa Cruz, there's Giant, there's Ibis. In fact, if we use Santa Cruz and Ibis as, as two examples, um, so these are essentially four bar designs because you've just basically moved the pivot way close to the bottom bracket instead of having it at the end of the chain set there. But the fundamental difference between them are you get links that move in the same direction, like the IBIS, so that's a DW link, and they move the same way, and on Santa Cruz, they move in opposite ways. So they have two totally different effects. Now, the DW link uh, tends to, I'd say it rides a little bit more like a single pivot. It's got quite high anti-squat, so they're, they're famed for climbing really well. You pedal them and they want to stand up a bit. So the suspension is still quite active on these, on this design. The VPP style design that Santa Cruz uses is a little bit different. They can basically manipulate the point of where they want their anti-squat to sort of kick in. So it's a little bit lower in the travel and it kind of holds itself there in the travel because the pivot point actually moves. Um, your axle path essentially moves through the travel. Uh, really quite a cool system, but rides totally differently, despite the fact, at a glance, 
short link bikes do look quite similar. Um, it's quite advanced stuff, but actually quite simple when we break it all down. So I promise I will make that video. I'll put my, uh, my best science jacket and glasses on and we'll try and make it nice and simple to explain all of the traits and what sort of riders they suit. Um, hopefully my ramblings have been kind of helpful. Um, hopefully they make sense. All right, a nice short question from Elias Sandal. Can I use WD-40 on my Maxwell as lubricant? Um, yes, but um, don't treat WD-40 as a lubricant, a sole lubricant. It's a solvent and it has got lubricant in it. Um, so you can't use it as a lubricant all the time, but it has got lubricating properties. But something that is really good about using it on a, on a Maxwell is it's a, it's a corrosion inhibitor, basically, so it stops rust and displaces water. So it's actually quite a useful thing to use there. You don't want to be putting heavy grease in that because what you're going to do when you take the axle out is you're going to drop it in the dirt, you have to clean it and stuff. So um, yeah, I think it's absolutely fine. You can use any light lube on there. You don't want to put too much on there, you don't want stuff to stick to it. Um, but yeah, it would do, do the job, so um, why not? Okay, next up's a brake rotor related question. Um, hey Doddy and Henry, I recently purchased a set of Zon rotors for my bike. They're pretty aggressive and they have large holes for, I presume, cooling. When I installed them though, the front made a very defined clicking noise every time the pads went over a hole in the disc. I've since taken them off for the sake of the bike. How can I fix it? I should add that I tried spacing them lower and higher and even changing the angle to no avail. Um, I've had a little look at these online, I've not actually seen them in the flesh, and you're right, the holes do look extremely big. Um, there is a chance that your particular brakes, um, you've not mentioned your brakes, uh, the brake pads are almost too small for the size holes in which they're basically they're catching an edge, um, in which case I wouldn't use them um, if that is the case. It's kind of hard to say what's going on without seeing them. I have heard this before from other riders though that have had that clicking sensation. If there's any chance of a brake accidentally locking up in that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it, I'd just get another set of rotors. Um, those rotors will be absolutely fine to use provided your brake pads are long enough. So they might be more orientated being aggressive brake pads for longer. Um, rotors for longer brake pads. Um, so just check that out, just check the size of the brake pad and how it correlates to those holes. Um, yeah, and well, use your common sense to the brakes. If you don't feel safe with them, don't use them. Okay, next up is also brake pad related. So this is from Le Type. Um, how is the compound of brake pads actually attached to the carrier plate? Um, whatever stuff stroke process they use must create a hell of a bond to withstand the forces applied and not shear off. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so I didn't know that much about this. I kind of knew a rough principle. So I actually spoke to Fibrax about this to get you the proper information. So Fibrax are a British company and they make brake pads in-house and they test everyone else's brake pads to try and make theirs the best. They're really, really, can't recommend them enough to be honest. Um, so I spoke to Ellis out there and this is directly from him. So he says, so the compound can be attached in a few different ways. The majority of brands that manufacture the brake pad material in a sheet, and then a cookie cutter, the sheet, and then glue it onto the backing plate. Um, although it's quick to say, something to note, this is not normal glue, it's an industrial adhesive. The same sort of stuff that aircraft builders use to glue parts onto their planes. Um, after this, they're baked, sprayed, and then packed, ready for use. Fibrax, however, manufacture their pads in a different way. Um, using the different powdered ingredients, including powdered adhesive, it's mixed up for the specific brake type, compression molded into what we call a biscuit. The biscuit is then glued in place on the backing plate. It's compressed again with added heat, which melts and squeezes the material struck glue through the biscuit and through the holes in the backing plate. This gives both a mechanical and chemical bond of the biscuit to that backing plate. Uh, we then paint, grind, pack, and sell those pads. Um, and this is them on screen. So there you go. Uh, of course, it has to be industrially strong given the fact it's a safety item. And having read what Ellis has just told me, I think five breaks sound like a really good option. Okay, Robbie White. Uh, hey Doddy, why have my forks travel decreased over time? When I push the lower legs back out, it goes to full amount, but if I put any weight on it, it will not return completely. Is it because I'm a very light rider or is it a result of something to do with my lockout? Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so I don't think it's lockout. It just sounds like I need a little bit of TLC, a bit of a service. Uh, the classic thing that happens over time is the negative spring stops working effectively on there. So negative spring is effectively what props them up. Um, so sometimes the air won't swap properly between the positive and negative. That can be dirt in there. It can be grease blocking the port 
on the inside. Or if you've got an older one, uh, they might be a coil negative spring, but usually it's an air negative spring these days. Um, and sometimes oil can get into that negative chamber, which has the same effect, it'll creep down slightly. Um, so they just need a little bit of TLC, a little bit of fork loving. Um, we're gonna be doing a real-time fork lower leg service soon, uh, and we're also gonna show you how to increase the travel on your forks as well. So that's a little video that will help you with that. Whew, and the last one this week is from JS. Guys, loving the show, talking about chaming sizes. Now, if I'm spinning a 32 tooth chamber and I want to try an oval ring, do I put a 32 or stick to a larger or a smaller ring? Thanks. Uh, well, if a 32 works for you and you want to try oval, stick with 32. Something you need to factor in though with oval chainrings is a 32 tooth chainring will effectively have on the larger part of that will be the same size as 34. Um, so just take that into account that you've got enough clearance on your bike. Um, I recently fitted a 32 to my Nootproof Mega. Uh, I would like to go for a 34, but I'm not sure I'd actually get one on there. So you can see it's obviously bigger on one axis to the other. Uh, and that's what I mean by how close it's gonna be uh, to your chain stay. So just take that into account, but just go like for like. Uh, there we go, there's another weekly Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Any questions, as always, you know the drill, ask them in those comments underneath. Uh, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, for a couple more videos, click down here if you wanna see a Tom Wheeler Pro Bike. I suggest you watch that, that's a really, really quite a different bike. And click down here for home security advice. This is everything from CCTV to ground anchors uh, to getting a Pitbull Terrier, anything like that that will help you keep your bike safe. As always, don't forget to click, share, subscribe, give us a thumbs up and click that that notification bell and it will tell you on your device every time we put a new video up. Cheers guys!